a great crowd. Thanks. I'm Kristen Dunham, director of the linguistics program, and it's like my, one of my favorite events of the year at Scholars Week presentations. So thank you, first of all, to Kathy McDonald. Dr. McDonald organized this, and it was so nice to have um, help and practice, and she did a great job coordinating our many speakers. Last year, as Marvin knows, we only had four, I think, so that was easier to coordinate. And it was um, only about 20 people, and half of them were professors. Yeah, well, look at this crowd. So we are going to have about 10 minutes for each presentation. Um, come on in. Hi, Ian. Hi. And um, a few minutes, two minutes after each one um, for some questions. So, um, and then while um, the question period is going on, the next person can prep and get ready to come on up. Um, so I, it's really exciting how many different classes these come out of. Uh, so at, I'll, I'll introduce each presenter um, or set of presenters when it's their turn so you can hear their names and the mentors who work with them. So our first up are Mike Jones and Jazzy Edwards. Um, so this is the only one where we have a dual presenters. Um, their presentation is a House of Cards and they came out of um, Dr. Kathy McDonald's um, districts analysis class and she is the mentor for this class and I have for each of you a certificate oh, one for Mike thank you and one for Jazzy thank you <laughs> You all know to look at your time right there, right? <laughs> Hi. I hope this is working. Our presentation, A House of Cards, A Construction and Deconstruction of Kevin Spacey, focuses on his um, sexual assault allegation apology. In 2016, Anthony Rapp accused Kevin Spacey of sexual assault when he was 14 years old. So the technique we used to analyze this statement was critical discourse analysis, uh, which is a theory or methodology that examines how specific instances of language use perpetrate existing ideologies and power structures, as well as how language goes from the way ideas are talked about to the way they are thought about within a socio-political context. The statement reads, I have a lot of respect and admiration for Anthony Rapp as an actor. I am beyond horrified to hear this story. I honestly do not remember the encounter. It would have been over 30 years ago. But if I did behave then, as he describes, I owe him the sincerest apology for what would have been deeply inappropriate drunken behavior. And I am sorry for the feelings he describes having carried with him all these years. This story has encouraged me to address other things about my life. I know that there are stories out there about me and that some have been fueled by the fact I have been so protective of my privacy. As those closest to me know, in my life, I have had relationships with both men and women. I have loved and had romantic encounters with men throughout my life. And I choose now to live as a gay man. I want to deal with this honestly and openly, and that starts with examining my own behavior. So in this talk, we will be examining the ways in which Spacey uses language to forge specific identities and relationships while simultaneously contradicting and deconstructing them. We will also examine the effects of his language on the socio-political discourse of LGBT rights and acceptance. There are three specific lines where he builds his identity and relationships. The first, I have a lot of respect and admiration for Anthony Rapp as an actor. Here, Spacey establishes two relationships. The first, for the reader, his perceived idea of the relationship with him, between him and Anthony Rapp by placing a professional boundary around it. Second, he defines relationship between him and the reader, reminding us who he is in the world, an actor, and therefore enacting a discourse of celebrity. In the second line, he says, I'm beyond horrified to hear this story, and he later apologi apologizes. He is saying exactly what the reader expects him to feel and to say, and by doing so, he humanizes himself. And lastly, he goes on to say, he has loved and had romantic encounters with men. By using the words loved and romance, which imply feelings and emotions we do not associate with rape, he distanced himself from the allegations. For the deconstruction of this apology, I focused only on the first paragraph, because if you guys noticed, he only apologized in the first paragraph. Um, the first line, I honestly do not 
remember the encounter, it would have been over 30 years ago. By using time as a valid excuse to not remember an instance of sexual assault, he disregards any responsibility or regret we expect him to feel or be carrying with him. He goes on to say, but if I did behave then as he describes, I owe him the sincerest apology. But and if are discourse of mar markers that indicate a negation of what was previously said. In this instance, it also implies the apology is conditional and simultaneously invalidates Raph's allegations. Finally, he goes, and I am sorry for the feelings he describes having carried with him for all these years. Here he places the weight and responsibility of having any emotions over what happened on Raph's shoulders. All right, so in the second paragraph of this statement, we see Kevin Spacey coming out of the closet using specific and unambiguous language. He is a gay man. He unequivocally aligns himself with the LGBT community, forging or shoring up the relationship between himself and his queer readers. Spacey also tells us that he is speaking openly and honestly, a direct reference to the credibility he hopes to have achieved with this statement and specifically his coming out story. Spacey is using this language to enact a specific identity that will garner support, sympathy, and understanding from specific readers who feel personally involved with the unfolding scandal. However, no instance of language use exists in a vacuum, and we must examine the unintended consequences of this part of the statement. As many LGBT Twitter users noted when the statement was issued, Spacey's coming out reveals an inexpert and indelicate handling of the complexities of queer identity politics. The placement of his coming out in the second paragraph, explicitly linked by the sentence, this story has encouraged me to address other things about my life, positions it as a direct reaction to Rapp's accusation. By mentioning homosexuality in this context, Spacey perpetrates the discourse of prejudices and beliefs about homosexuality and sexual misconduct. In doing so, Spacey has perpetrated the stereotype of queer people as sexual predators. While the cultural shift in the past 10 to 15 years toward acceptance has largely fossilized this stereotype as a relic of another time, it has been weaponized quite recently in debates over so-called transgender bathroom bills and is therefore still an active force within the discourse of the struggle for queer acceptance. Spacey also uses the unfortunate turn of phrase, I choose now to live as a gay man. Use of the word choice in revealing his sexual orientation is rooted in the discourse of coming out by choosing how and when to ex acknowledge one's identity. However, choose is also rooted in the discourse of LGBT rights and oppression and the long-standing argument that homosexuality is a choice. Spacey's use of the word here allows both for the inference that he is choosing at this time to openly embrace his identity and also the, that the orientation itself is being chosen. Much of the debate over LGBT rights hinges on this point, and coming from a prominent member of the LGBT population, Spacey's seeming admission of choice could be weaponized by anti-equality voices in future debates over civil rights. Finally, Spacey's characterization of his coming out as something he has to deal with indicates a personal inconvenience on his part. It also hints at what many Twitter users suspected when the statement was issued, that Spacey is merely using the revelation of his sexual identity as a smokescreen to distract from Rapp's allegations and the non-apology that we have already examined. The language use of this non-apology is rooted in the discourse of an actor and creates a performance to please a crowd. His choice of phrasing and discourse markers attempts to showcase a character the audience would rally behind. Instead, he ends up discrediting himself and what he has to say while a alienating himself from a community he claims to have chosen to belong to. It brought his career and credibility crashing down like a house of cards. Well, we had Professor McDonald's class, and we had to choose a body of language and then figure out what we thought it was saying, not just on service, but beneath the service, surface. And at the time, there were so many sexual allegations between Harvey Weinstein, and it seemed like every day there was someone new. And so this just seemed like an important topic at the time. There you go. Well, actually, in another class, following this class, I did another 
um, project on sexual harassment apologies, and they kind of follow a similar pattern of spending the first portion like ap apologizing, and then the rest making it about them or trying to build themselves back up from obviously losing credibility. Thank you. Thank you.